All right, here we go, y'all. We are in Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. You can turn to somebody and say, please mark in your Bibles. Please mark in your Bibles. We have been saying that for the past, what, uh, I feel like going on 40 weeks at this point. Is We are in the book of Mark, and we are taking our time as we are following in the footsteps of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so happy that you are with us, again, uh, to find that space either on your digi phone or digi, digi Bible, um, or if you have your paper Bible, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 13 through 17 is where we will be. If you did not bring a Bible, we will show the text here on the screen. Show the text here on the screen. All right. Um, before we get started, before we get into that, I, uh, yes, Danielle, thanks for teeing up, just reminding us of what we talked about last week. We talked about the landowner and the vine growers. And where we come out of that narrative, Jesus is in the temple and he is being confronted, confronted by the Pharisees and the religious leaders. That's the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the leaders and, uh, and the elders. And they are leaders of the temple who are asking Jesus, what authority do you have to confront how we do business here? What authority do you have, Jesus, to confront us on how, you do, how we do business here? Jesus had come into the temple and into the temple courts, and he had overthrown all the money changers and overthrown all of the, the, uh, the, the stations of business, and he, he confronted corrupt business practices that were being held in the temple in order to take advantage of people in, um, in, in taking their money for financial gain. And so Jesus comes in, and he overturns the table, and he starts, you know, driving out the cattle from the temple courts that were being used for sacrifices. And he turns to the religious elders and religious leaders who confront him. And he says, like, how, how dare you do this? Don't you know that the word says my house, my father's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. My father's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And what have you done? You have turned it into a den of of robbers, a den of robbers. And so Jesus, he asserts his authority as the son of God, God with flesh on. He comes into the temple courts on this week of Passover and all of these different uh, uh, types of people from all different cultures, all different territories, all different places are on these pilgrimages and they come into the temple courts and there's Gentiles in the temple courts and there's Jewish believers in the Gentile courts and they're coming with their offerings and this place is absolutely busy and bustling and people are coming to worship and here is Jesus seeing these religious leaders putting obstacles up between the people and their worship. And he is infuriated. He is enraged. It says in the word that, that he would burn with passion for his father's house. And so he comes at the, the sight of this great injustice and he begins to overthrow the tables and the money changers and he confronts the religious leaders and he says, you're creating stumbling blocks. And he even goes so far as to use some pretty choice language as he calls them hypocrites. He says, you hypocrites, what are you doing? And, and, and we can, we can uh, relate that to the, to the illustration that Jesus, while he was on his way to the temple, he cursed a fig tree. Why? Because the fig tree was full of leaves, but there was no fruit. And we know that in that context, a fig tree being full of leaves would indicate that this tree would have fruit on the vine. And Jesus comes to the tree and, there's, and it's full of leaves, but there's no fruit. And so he curses the fig tree. The fig tree withers and dies. And Jesus uses that as an illustration on what is going to come upon the uh, religious establishment and the temple as Jesus has come into the courts and he's seeing Pharisees in their legalism and religiosity and he's seeing them in their robes with their phylacteries and their, their uh, pride and he's saying, you are a people who are full of leaves, but there is no fruit. You're full of leaves, but there is no fruit. And we talked about how sometimes we can be a people as Christ followers where we can be full of leaves. Like, look at my leaves. Look what I can put out there. Look, look how healthy I am. Look at this is what a, 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 a healthy Christ follower looks like. I know strict scripture. I know the law. I know what it looks like to walk like a Christian. I know what it looks like to go to church on Sunday. But I'm wondering if Jesus is asking us, where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? You got plenty of leaves. You look good. You're in your best dress on Sunday. You know how to walk the part, talk the talk. But when the push comes to shove, Jesus 
is looking for the evidences of his grace working in you and through you by way of fruit. And we say, hey, Pastor Luke, what does fruit look like? And it's very simple for me to rattle off what fruit looks like. And I do so about every other Sunday. Fruit looks like love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what fruit looks like. And so when we take assessment of our life, we say, hey, hey, Jesus, do a little inventory. Do a little bit of assessment. I know I got some stuff going on. I know I know scripture. I know it to a T. I know the songs. I know what it means to come through on Sunday to worship you. But when the push comes to shove, Lord, am I putting on display the fruit of your spirit as much as I'm putting on the leaves to say that I'm a man or a woman who, who follows Jesus and because of the grace that he has worked in and through my life, I am full of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This is the kind of fruit that Jesus is looking for, and it's a, it's a witness, it's an evidence of his grace working in you and through you. And so he's in this space where the, the, uh, the, the uh, religious elite, the Pharisees and the elders, uh, come and approach him along with the scribes in uh, Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 1, and they say, what authority do you have to do this thing? By what authority do you have to, to overturn our tables and to create such a stir in these temple courts? And Jesus says to them, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, by what authority did God uh, give John his baptism? Or by what authority was John's baptism? Was it from heaven or was it from men? Which put them in quite a conundrum. Put them in a conundrum to where they, would not, they were not able to admit where John's baptism came from. And because they were in this conundrum, because they didn't want to verify or validate the, the anointing of Jesus as the Son of God and the coming Messiah, but they were also afraid of men and they didn't want to succumb to the stoning and, and potential killing of them because Jesus had been built with such popularity and John was known to be a prophet. They stayed quiet and said, oh, we, we just don't know. And Jesus said, well, neither will I give you an answer. If you haven't seen yet, if you haven't known yet, by what authority I come, then I'm not so sure that there's any hope for you. Your heart has been hardened against me. You have seen, you have heard, and you know. You've seen the miracles. You've heard the teachings. You've been blown away. You've been mesmerized and put in awe. And yet, because you are so uh, obsessed with your own power and pride you, and your own idea of what the Messiah would look like, you cannot submit to the fact that you know God is in your midst because it doesn't fit your agenda. It doesn't come and fulfill what you believe it should have fulfilled. It doesn't come in the way that you thought he would come. No, this is a Jesus who comes lowly riding on a donkey into the gates of Jerusalem. This is a nomadic rabbi who comes by way of Nazareth. And we say, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Or Owings Mills, can anything good come from Owings Mills? Essex, Dundalk, what, can any, Baltimore, can anything good come from, yes. A good thing comes from Nazareth, and his name is Jesus, and he's the Messiah. Good things come from Baltimore, too. It's called the Ravens. I don't know if you're going to be watching on Sunday, but the 1 o'clock, be there. You can come watch it with me. So here we are in this space, and Jesus gives them a parable as they confront him once again. He gives them a parable of a landowner who rented out land to some workers who were planting vineyards. And when Jesus sent his servants to collect on the rent, instead of giving the landowner his rightful rent, what is due him the fruit of their labor from him renting out his land to them, instead he kills their servants. And he also gives this parable where he says, and then the landowner had one servant left to send them, his son, his only son, and they killed his son. And he said, what is the landowner to do? Well, the landowner will come and destroy all that which is rightly his. He will come. And so he likens that to their leadership, their witness. He says, look, you're killing my pro the prophets. You killed the servants. You killed the ministers. And you're going to kill the son. And the father will have the last word. Soften your hearts. 
Allow the Lord to, to reveal to you in this space of having a hardened heart against Jesus and his lordship in your midst, in your presence. Know who he is and give God his worship. Give God the fruit that he is working in you and through you. It's his. You belong to him. You belong to him. We say everything that the Lord has given us is on borrowed time. Everything the Lord has given us, he's given us out of his hands, your body, your breath, your mind, your thought, everything. The Lord has given you this space, your home, your job, your career. He has given it to you. So what do we do when we return? We express gratitude through worship. We glorify him in the arenas that he has put on lease. And we become good stewards and give God what belongs to him. So interesting how in this follow-up uh, text, after that interaction takes place, we're a bit removed from it, but then the Pharisees and the Herodians come together, which is a alliance that wouldn't typically take place. Pharisees and Herodians typically didn't have anything to do with each other. They actually hated one another, but in this time, they are in cahoots, if you will. They are planning to destroy Jesus, to kill Jesus. If we go back to um, Mark chapter 3, verse 6, when, Je uh, when Jesus healed the man with the withered hand, um, we create a little rap to that. He healed a man with a withered hand, um, and, and, and Jesus heals this man, and then it was at that point that the Pharisees and the Herodians together began to formulate this plot to kill Jesus. Pharisees were sold out religious elite that were, had an allegiance to uh, Israel and the Herodians were like Pharisees in their religious beliefs but they had more of an allegiance to Rome and that's why they did not have anything to do with one another. This is a very appropriate text for us to be following up from last week because it has ties to this parable of the landowner. Give God what belongs to God. And we're going to read and dig into that a bit more. It says this, it says, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him, that is Jesus, in order to trap him in a statement. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and do not care what anyone thinks, for you are not partial to anyone, but you teach the way of God in truth. Is it permissible to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Are we to pay or not to pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought him one. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God. And they were utterly amazed at him. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing for me to be in this football season. Uh, I have the privilege of coaching my son's football team. We get all, you know, we, we put on the the, the shirts and the jerseys. Uh, Chris was there on Sunday rooting my son on. We got stomped, y'all. We got stomped yesterday, boy. It was a hard-fought game, um, but we lost big time. Not going to say the score, but we played hard. We played hard, and I had my hat on, and I had my, my jersey on, and my whistle, and we're ready to get after it. And, and in preparation for this, for this message, I was thinking about um, football in light of what's going on here because yes I am a, a big Ravens fan all right I am a Ravens fan I know we have a uh, a Washington uh, commanders fan over here you know we're, we're praying for you brother sooner or later you can come over into this righteous space um but but uh but but what I was thinking about was how we put on the jersey we put on the jersey and, and what we do when we put on the jersey when we put on the jersey and we root for our favorite team what we're doing is we're identifying with the players on the field we're identifying with what's going on who we're rooting for and in many ways what we do is we put on this jersey even if it's not Sunday and we walk around and what are we doing we are reflecting the glory of the team that we're rooting for and we are also promoting an allegiance to the team that we are playing for so this is like the glory of the commanders right not that there is much or the glory of the ravens right that they hate super bowls let's go uh, that, that that we have that allegiance to we we walk around 
around and we are reflecting glory and allegiance. And all you have to do in order to get a little taste of what that looks like is to hit Raven Stadium on a Sunday, you know, the, the, the world's biggest insane asylum, and you walk in there and people got the jerseys on and they are drooling and spitting and yeah, rah, rah, and they're rooting on their team and they're having a good time and high-fiving. They are identifying with the team on the field. So all that they say and do goes toward, goes toward the promotion Motion of who they have allegiance to, all right? And in light of this text, it's what Jesus is confronting here. We have Pharisees and Herodians. We have Pharisees who have an, a, a righteous allegiance to the nation of Israel that have the jerseys on. And they are promoting allegiance to and the glory of what their idea God is all about as given to them by the law. I mean, these guys are strict legalists. They follow the law to the T, that Moses is their hero. Abraham is their hero. Isaac is their hero. And, and everything that they do and say points to their history and to their traditions and how they are supposed to go about things to present themselves clean and righteous before the Lord. And so they are sold out to that modus operandi. And that's what they give their life to for his his glory works based put on the garb make sure your hands are clean follow the rules this is how we celebrate and promote our team and the Herodians on the other side yes we do some of those things but we also have a greater allegiance to Rome and so hail Caesar hail see this is what it looks like to live like a Roman this is what we put our allegiance toward the promotion of progress according to Rome and their rule and we also have our religious dispositions and our instructions but we have an allegiance to the furtherance of this state and so they have the jerseys on and so what they do is they go to Jesus and they're talking about this tax that is placed on the Israelite people that has put a heavy burden on them but co makes collections for the furtherance of Rome which is the dominating superpower of the day and we are a part of this Roman culture and so they ask Jesus they say when the poll tax comes are we to pay our monies to Rome in obedience and they want to trap Jesus because they want to know, hey, what team do you play for? What team do you root for? Do we pay the tax in allegiance to Rome? Do we pay the tax in allegiance to Caesar? What team, or do you say that's evil and do you abstain and be, then become a part of a resistance and, and lead that resistance against Rome and you're the Messiah and all these things that the people say you are? Like, what team do you really play for? You know, it's so funny because so often in our walk, we are so determined to choose sides. We are so determined to just choose sides. And, and when I look at this narrative of Jesus, so often when people tried to stick Jesus in choosing a side, are you on the religious side? Are you on the Roman side? Like, are you on, like, what side are you on? Is it, is it good to do works on the Sabbath? You should, you, should you relax and rest? What is it? that you're about? What side? And, and you know what I like to say? I like to say that Jesus is the king of the third way. Because when we are so dichotomous as a people, Jesus always, by his grace, comes in in some sort of way and, and convinces us or convicts us by his wisdom to think kingdom. And kingdom is the third way. You know, in this, uh, in this uh, political temperature, we like to say, you know, are we, are we donkeys or elephants, man? Like, are you a donkey or are you an elephant? No, man, I'm a, I'm a lamb party member. I'm a party of the lamb, the, the, the lion of Judah. I'm kingdom party. I follow Jesus. He sets my life on the course that is in line with his heart. That's, that's the party that I choose. God's kingdom agenda. How can I promote that? How can I live in that? How can my fruit point to that? God's kingdom agenda. The authority and reign of Jesus. The fruit of the spirit being poured out on me. How can heaven on earth touch this spot right where I am at any given moment? Because that's the kingdom agenda. That's the party. Heaven through earth or heaven to earth through you. That's where we are with Jesus. And so Jesus says, hey, look, let's confront this. Let's address this. He says, bring me a denarius. Give me a denarius. Give me the coinage that is represented of Rome 
and is accepted by Roman standards. This is what they accept. This is their standard of money and currency. Bring me a denarius. And so they bring him the denarius and he says, whose image is on the denarius? Whose image is on there? They said Caesar, meaning Caesar Tiberius, the son of Caesar Augustus. So Caesar Tiberius is on the coin. Give it to Caesar. If his image is on it, it must mean that it belongs to him. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You know, the Bible reminds us that like, we, we don't store up for ourselves on earth treasures that, that moths and rust destroy. Nothing that we have here we can take along with us. It is useful and we steward it for the will and glory of God. But at the end of the day, what truly belongs to God will be with him forever in heaven and be made new. This denarius, moths and rust are going to destroy this and everything that that thing can purchase. So give it to Caesar. Give what Caesar is Caesar's. His image is on it. Give it back to him. It obviously belongs to him if his image is on it. As a matter of fact, inscribed on that denarius would be Caesar Augustus Tiberius, the one who is currently reigning, son of the divine Augustus. Son of the divine Augustus. You know that they attached divinity to the leaders of Rome? They attach, this is a God man. This is a God ruler. So all hail Caesar, bow down and worship Caesar. Everything that you have, everything in this space, everything that you are belongs to him. Jesus confronts that by saying, "Eh, not so, but whatever does belong to him, render to him what is his. This coin belongs to him. So render to Caesar what is Caesar's. And he says, And render to God what is God's. You know what's incredible is that as he's talking to this religious leaders and he says whose image is on the coin and at just their answer of saying Tiberius Caesar's, he's the ruler, we'll give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is his. And how would they understand that? They know the scriptures. They know what the word says. They know what it says in Genesis. They know what it says from the beginning. They would go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, as Jesus confronts this and he says, hey, whose image is on it? All right, then give it to him. It's his. It belongs to him. He can order you however he wants concerning what belongs to him. That money is on lease, if you will. Give it to him. It's his. It's temporal anyway. Give it to him. This doesn't own you. This isn't your master. This isn't something that, is, that you're going to allow to enslave you. Show him that you're willing to give him what's his. And in light of that, he says, and give to God what belongs to God. But we have to read this in concert with the image instruction. His image is on it, so it belongs to him. Give it to him. But then they would go, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and they would say, what does this mean? God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Jesus is confronting worship. Jesus is confronting priorities. Jesus is confronting your identity Jesus is confronting who you are and who you were created to be. And as much as that coin has the image of Caesar imprinted on it and belongs to Caesar, you have the imprint of God and Christ on you. So let me ask you this. Who do you belong to? You were made in God's image. God said, let us make man in our image and in the image of God. He created them. He created you with a divine imprint. Mine. You belong to me. To to be loved by me 
and to love others as I would have you love them. You belong to me. Hey, this is a, just another tee up of the landowner. Give to the landowner what's due the, the, the landowners. Give to Caesar what is due Caesar's, but also give to God what is due God. And what is due God? You. You. Give Caesar your money but give God yourself. And you know what's amazing? You know what's amazing? That, that God doesn't leave us out on a limb to show us what that looks like. And how can we say that? Well, how, do, how can we say that God just can't leave us out on a limb and just with his instructions, just show us what it means to give ourselves to God? No, 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 because in John 3.16, we are to give God what's due God. In, God, in uh, John 3.16, God gives us an example and representation to let us know that he was willing to go the nth degree for us, for us to have him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his son even up until the point of death so that he could reclaim us and restore us to himself. Live in eternity with him, for, uh, him forever, not based on our own flawed reflection of his image, but because of what he was able to do because we couldn't do it. And then reclaiming us to himself to be in his family forever. It's grace. He gave us his son so that we could give him ourselves and so that we could live in the fullness of what that image looks like. Because he gave us his son, his son died on a cross in forgiveness of his in the forgiveness of our sins. He was able to absolve our sin in him. He was the propitiation for our sins on the cross from beginning to end. And now un our unrighteousness is veiled by his righteousness. So when he looks at you, he doesn't just see you, he sees himself. His image is veiled. We has veiled our unrighteousness with his righteousness. And so that everything he sees when he looks on us is nothing but his own righteousness that's his image and so we belong to him he's covered us we are imprinted once and for all when we couldn't get it right on our own when we kept messing up we kept lying cheating stealing gossiping thinking murderous thoughts adultering like we kept doing all these things and it's just this broken fractured image in ourselves and we say well I can't ever get back to God when he looks on me there's no way he can see his image reflected back to himself and he goes, because of that, I sent Jesus to die in your stead because you can't do it. So he lived that perfect life so he could pay for our sins. No spot, no blemish. The perfect sacrifice that was put on the cross. And when he laid his life down and he said, it is finished, it meant that we are done trying to achieve getting to God. But he has made it possible by his grace. And so when he looks upon us, he sees the image of his son imprinted on us. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. It's your worship. It's your praise. It's your gratitude. God, you saved my life. You brought me into eternal life, not because of what I could do, but because of what you've already done. My image, I've been conformed daily unto your likeness. I've been sanctified into Christ's likeness. Why? Because his grace compels me to live for you. It's not your judgment. It's not, you know, some rod that's going to be beating me down. It's not me getting. No, it's your grace that compels me to give my life as a living offering to you, to reflect your image in this broken world, to be compelled by your grace to live according to your good purpose. It is a gift and it is a joy. Why? Because you did what I could not do. The free gift of grace now exercised through me and now I can be a full reflection of who you are. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I walk on water. It just means that the one who was perfect and could walk on water died in my place so that he could see himself in me. It's an amazing gift. So give Caesar what is Caesar's. And what belongs to God, give to God. When Jesus died on the cross and we placed our belief and faith in him, we put on the right jersey. We, we, we didn't put on the, we took off the jersey of our 
political affiliation. We took off the jersey of our nationalism. We took off the jersey of our pride. We took off the, the jersey of whatever we felt like most identifies us. We, we took off those broken, fractured, loser team jerseys and we put on his righteousness like putting on new clothes. The word says, put on Christ like you're putting on new clothes. And when we put on Christ like we're putting on new clothes, we are proclaiming that we live, we root, we have allegiance to Christ's team for his glory. We're here. We're Christ. We belong to Christ. Guess what? No one can take that jersey off you. No one can, can accuse that jersey and stand. No one can come up against that jersey. No one can put up, but come up against that armor. Nothing can pull you away from, away from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not sword, not persecution, not depth, not heights, not width, not breadth. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ, love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the jersey I wear. That's the jersey that I put on. He said, put on Christ daily. He gives us the, 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 the armor of God. It's like our helmet, our shoulder pads, our knee pads. Like we're ready to ball, man. Why? Because I'm standing in the power, the righteousness and victory and grace of Christ. And I can't lose. Why? Because I've already won. And so we don't even, we don't even play or, or work toward a victory. No, we know that we have victory in Jesus. That's our launch pad. That's not our landing pad. That's not the end zone. That's the starting line. We have victory. You can't take off my jersey. You can't take off my armor. We've got the helmet of salvation securely fit on our heads, protecting our mind and thoughts, taking every thought captive. We have those thoughts submitted to Christ. We are protected by the security we have in his rescue and him having the last word. We put on the breastplate of righteousness that, that protects our desires and our innermost feelings and aligns them with God's and has no lie able to pierce the breastplate to get to our vital organs, which is the heart. And we put on the belt of truth where everything holds together in the person of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we have our shoes shod with the gospel of peace so that when we walk the gospel of victory comes with us and every territory in which the sole of our foot hits as it says in Joshua is already promised to us and we take up the shield of faith that is able to extinguish the fiery arrows of the evil one and we take up the sword of the spirit that is God's word and sharper than any double-edged sword and we are fully armed to parry and to counter and to defend ourselves versus any attack that the enemy has to throw our way and we walk in the righteousness of God covered by his grace and mercy, his strength, his power, and his victory. If God be for us, who can be against us? Our team wins. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. It's the call on our life. Jesus is confronting these Pharisees and these Herodians and he's turning the tables on what they're asking him. They're trying to catch him in a trap. And Jesus turns the tables and he looks at the Pharisees that have this jersey on and the Herodians that have that jersey on. And he looks at the coin and he says, what jersey does this currency have on? Okay, give it to that team. And then he says, and what about you? Whatever is God's, render to God. And he's making them think, and he says, in not so many words, it's you. You're so convinced that you belong to a team that is being defined by the ways of this world. And you've neglected to acknowledge that the team you play for is the kingdom team. And you are a kingdom representative. So glorify God. Put on your jersey, know that you're covered, and walk according to his goodwill for your life. It's the gospel, man. And you know what's crazy? When it comes to God's team, there are no tryouts. No tryouts. You don't earn it. You don't earn a place on this squad. You don't earn a place on this team. 
You don't look at the other players and go, well, I got to run faster than them. I got to catch better than them. I got to hit harder than them. I got to jump higher than them. I got to kick farther than them. I got to pass more accurately than them. No, you don't look around and say, what are they doing? What are they doing? No, God, the coach says, hey, you want to be on the team or not? I got your jersey right here. I got your jersey right here. It fits you. It looks good on you. You'll develop while you come along. The other players around you. It's a good fit, and you don't have to work for it. You just have to receive it. And then there's something else that I got for you. Give me that thing right there. Yeah, that. It's called the playbook. We, we got a playbook. And everything that has been promised and that will be promised and that has been done and will be done is all recorded in the writ of this word. And this playbook has the game plan that never fails. Live according to my word. You can't fail. You got the jersey and you got the playbook. And you've got the best coach that has ever lived in the history of the world. His name's God. And Christ is our quarterback. I could keep going and going and going and going with this illustration, boy. Like, we've got everything we need. Because we've already won. And so we just thank God. Thank you, God, for reminding us that we're on your team. And you fought battles that we, we haven't even thought about. Man, you've protected us in ways that we can't even imagine. I mean, the fact that we got here this morning. All the things that could have gone wrong by your hand and your providence and your sovereignty, according to your plan, you brought us here right now to remind us that you are king. We are bought with a price and we belong on your team, not because of what we could do, but because of what you've already done. That's a free gift of grace. Lord, we are here and we are confessing. You are Lord. You created us. You knit us together in our mother's womb. You know every hair on our head, every thought in our mind, every desire of our heart. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you died for us so that we could be with you forever. Forever yours. When we get sucked in to the sides we're tempted to choose, when we get sucked in to, to believe in that we play for a certain team that is of this world. When we get sucked into holding on to things that don't even belong to us. When we get sucked into giving ourselves to things that we shouldn't be giving ourselves to. Lord, remind us this day right now whom we belong to. What jersey we wear. Who do we play for? What kingdom wins? It's yours. Help us, Lord. Lord, if there's anybody in this space right now. Lord, that, that has just come to the determination through the leading of your Holy Spirit. That's the team I want to play for. That's the God that I'm created to serve. That's who I want to give my life to. That's who I want to follow. Lord, I pray that right now they would be receptive in their heart. Lord, that you would infiltrate them deeply, soften that space, fill them with your love. Lord, that they would confess, I am a sinner saved by grace. You are Lord and you walked this earth sinless and spotless and laid your life down in my stead, paid the price that I could not pay so that I could be with you forever, that I could be filled with the Holy Spirit so that I could be forgiven, that I could walk an eternal life starting right now. History began the day that I said yes to the coach's invitation, put on the jersey and be mine. Let that be a decision for anyone who's withholding today. And if not, Lord, I pray that you would continue as you promise in your word. Draw hearts to me as my name is lifted up. We trust you, Lord, in your perfect timing, your perfect plan, purpose, your sovereignty, your glory, and your grace. We thank you that we serve a patient God. But we also confess and acknowledge that you want us now right now. Help us to be more wise and discerning 
to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to give to God what's God's, our very selves and all that we have. We thank you, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand for a benediction. So wonderful to be with you in worship today. For those of you that are new, I would love to meet you, pray for you if anybody needs prayer, um, and also encourage you to come back next week. God's doing something very special here. So our final benediction, some of you who are new will, um, will hear some people around you knowing this verse. This is our family verse. And as you come, return, you'll, you'll memorize this verse as well. But here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, which is our family verse. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Rise City Church, friends and family. I pray that you rise and shine this week as you render to God what is God's in worship that is your whole self. You got the jersey, so go reflect the team that you play for this week. Amen? Amen.